Hi. Today Parikshit and I are going to be presenting channel polarization, which is a method for constructing capacity achieving codes for symmetric binary input channels. This is a 2009 paper of Erda Larikan, who is incidentally the Shannon Award winner for this year. We begin with a quick introduction to coding theory. So consider a scenario where Alice wishes to communicate a message to Bob, but can only do so via noisy medium. Is there any way to guarantee that Bob will receive the correct message with high probability? So to put things formally, let's consider an example. A single bit is being transmitted over a binary erasure channel or BEC, which with probability P independently erases each bit. So if a single bit is transmitted as it is, the probability of being lost is just P. But Alice could also just try to repeat the same bit multiple times, just say thrice. In this case, the message is only lost if all the three transmitted bits are erased. While this guarantees a higher likelihood of Bob receiving the original message, the catch is that the channel is used thrice, which costs power. So a natural question to ask is, for a message of size k, what is the minimum number of bits n that is required to ensure that the original message is recoverable with high probability? Shannon's groundbreaking and far more general result, in an asymptotic setting, a ratio of k over n, called the rate, of 1 minus p is possible, but it's not clear how to achieve this. With some background setup, let us dive into channel polarization. As an example to motivate the notion of polarization, let's consider a 2-bit message u1, u2 transmitted over a BEC. Instead of transmitting the message as it is, let's transmit the first bit as a sum u1 plus u2 and the second bit as just u2 itself, as shown in the figure. On the other end, let's consider a simple iterative procedure to estimate u1, u2 from y1, y2. In the first round, we use y1 and y2 to try to estimate u1, and in the second round, let's use y1, y2 as well as our estimate of for u1 from the first round to decode u2. As a first step to analyzing this procedure, let's consider a genie-aided setting, where in the second round, a genie tells us the true value of u1 that was originally transmitted. Let's try to see what the error rates for the estimates of u1 and u2 look like in this procedure. We can think about this process of sequential decoding as two induced channels w- and w+. As you can see in the figure, y1 and y2 are used to decode u1 in w- and y1, y2 and u1 are used to decode u2 in w+. Let's try to analyze w- first. There are four possible cases corresponding to y1 and y2 being or not being erased. Just to recap, if y1 is not erased, we obtain u1 plus u2, and if y2 is not erased, we receive u2 correctly. So in order to recover u1, both y1 and y2 must not be erased. And in this case, we can just use y1 minus y2 to guess the value of u1. Both y1 and y2 are intact with probability 1 minus p square, and with the remaining probability, there is no hope of recovering u1. So in essence, w minus behaves like a BEC with erasure probability 1 minus 1 minus p squared. On the other hand, let's, let's consider w plus. If y2 is received, then u2 is directly recovered. Also, if y1 is received, since we are in a genie-aided setting and assume that u1 is known for this round, we can once again recover u2. This is just by doing y1 minus u1. So with probability p square, both y1 and y2 are lost and u2 is unrecoverable. And with the remaining probability, we know u2. So once again, in essence, w plus behaves like a BEC, but this time with erasure probability p squared. So let's summarize. w plus behaves like a channel having erasure probability p square which itself is less than p, while w minus has erasure probability 1 minus 1 minus p squared, which is higher than p. This is precisely the phenomenon of channel polarization. This concludes the 2-bit input case in a geniated setting. It's natural to ask when does such a geniated setting actually hold true? We will answer this question in some time. In fact, this construction for 2 bits can be extended to longer length input strings as illustrated in the figure for an 8-bit input.
induced channels are simply BECs of P which correspond to the depth zero circuit. Moving one step deeper, two BEC of P channels are combined in pairs to create four copies each of W plus and W minus. Moving one step deeper, pairs of W plus and W minus are combined to form W plus plus, W plus minus, W minus plus and W minus minus. And the recursive construction continues. Quite interestingly, we will show that the channel polarization behavior actually intensifies for longer length inputs. So n equal to 16, 32 and so on. Hopefully the arguments to follow will show why this might be the case. This construction for a 2 power n length input can be thought of in a different light as the following recursion tree. This tree represents the erasure probabilities of the channels induced at each depth of the above circuit. Each of the final 2 power n induced channels are the terminal nodes of this tree. At each branching of the tree, two copies of the parent channel are combined to form two new polarized channels. So for example, P0 and P1 here correspond to the erasure probabilities of W- and W+, constructed from two copies of W. This itself corresponds to the depth 1 circuit where U1 is mapped to U1 plus U2. And what we can establish from the construction is that in moving deeper into the tree, the following recurrence relation holds true for the erasure probabilities. Arikan's main claim is that a uniformly chosen terminal node, which corresponds to one of the 2 power n induced channels, almost surely has erasure probability equal to 0 or 1 in an asymptotic setting. The first step in showing this result is to consider a Bernoulli random walk into this tree which induces a uniform distribution over all the leaf channels. Indeed, this recurrence relation will help establish that in proceeding deeper into the tree, the erasure probabilities form a martingale, which is a starting point in the proof. I will now pass the baton to Parikshit, who will put these ideas into a more formal setting. We will now show that the random variable Pn is a martingale with the filtration Fn equals sigma of the Bernoulli random variables B1 to Bn. By the construction of the random walk model, Pn is measurable in Fn. Now let's compute the conditional expectation of Pn plus 1 given Fn. Notice that B1 to Bn get fixed and Bn plus 1 is 0 with the probability of half and is 1 with the probability of half. According to the recursion defined in the previous slide, the new erasure probability when you move down in the binary tree is 1 minus of 1 minus p the whole square and when you move up in the binary tree is p square. Simplifying this expression, we see that it is equal to p of b1 to bn, which is nothing but the random variable pn. Hence, pn is a martingale. Notice that since pns are probabilities of erasure, they are bounded between 0 and 1. Therefore, their expectations are also bounded between 0 and 1. This enables us to apply martingale convergence theorem, which says that the sequence of random variables pn converges to a random variable denoted by p infinity almost surely. As always, martingale convergence theorem doesn't tell us how p infinity looks. So let's try to compute that now. Notice that pn minus pn plus 1 converges to 0 almost surely. And since they are bounded random variables, by bounded convergence theorem, the expectation of their difference also converges to 0. Also, recall that with probability of half, pn plus 1 equals pn square. Using this, we can lower bound the expectation of their difference by half times the expectation of pn minus pn square. Factoring this term, it is equal to pn into 1 minus pn. This is clearly a non-negative quantity and is upper bounded by a quantity which converges to 0. Therefore, even this converges to 0. Now, the expectation of a non-negative random variable is 0 only when the random variable is equal to 0 almost surely. Therefore, this means that p infinity is equal to either 0 or 1. What does this mean? This means that our new transform channels are either completely noiseless with erasure probability 0 or they are completely noisy with erasure probability 1. But what fraction of them are completely noisy? This probability can simply be written as the expected value of p infinity which is equal to p by the bounded convergence theorem. So, in conclusion, from n binary erasure channels, all with erasure probability p, we have constructed n new channels in which p fraction of them are completely noisy 
and 1 minus p fraction of them are completely noiseless. Observe that we haven't talked about how to identify which channels are noisy and which are noiseless. Rest assured that Arikan in his paper prescribes an algorithm to find this, but that is not a focus of this talk. Assuming that it is done, what do Alice and Bob do now? Alice simply sends her K information bits through the K channels which are completely noiseless. In all the other channels, she sends a fixed bit 0 which is known by Bob beforehand. Now Bob goes through the channels one by one. If the channel is completely noiseless, he can recover the bit correctly with probability 1. If the channel is completely noisy, then he already knows that the corresponding bit is 0. Since there are n times 1 minus p noiseless channels, k can be made as large as n times 1 minus p. This is capacity achieving as claimed by Shannon in 1948. In fact, polar codes were the first class of codes which were shown to be capacity achieving. We will end with one final note on the original paper. For the sake of simplicity, here we have only dealt with the binary erasure channel. If you were to see Arakan's paper, he deals with a general discrete channel with a general conditional distribution W of y given x. This general model requires us to manipulate some more sophisticated quantities. To be very brief, a generalization of the erasure P called the Bhattacharya parameter is used and also the fraction of noiseless channels obtained 1 minus P generalizes to what is called symmetric capacity. However, the proof idea remains very similar. You will show that Zn is a super martingale and that In is a martingale. Of course, the computations will be much more complicated. With that, we end this presentation which illustrated a very interesting and useful application of martingale theory. Here are our references and thank you for listening.